15 years ago, I was traveling through Africa. And as I traveled on a bus down into the deep cold regions, as I was on the bus, in the very back, I realized that I wasn't comfortable. I was in the back where the back wheels were. It was an old, rickety school bus. My knees were cramped up in the seat. And I was trying to be patient for the hours and hours on the bus. But it was too much. I had enough. So I stood up and I walked to the front of the bus. And there was a little boy, small, maybe about 10. And I asked him, would you switch seats with me? And he agreed that he would. In Africa, men, um, when they make requests to children, it is imperative that children follow uh, the orders. So the child immediately went to the back of the bus, and I sat in the front. And I was comfortable, particularly when a white man asked. After that experience, uh, later, when the bus was traveling, The driver had been drinking all day on this bus trip, and he started to swerve off to the side of the road, and to the left, and to the right, and finally crashed the bus, and there was a terrible explosion. Uh, glass broke, everything busted up, and when I got out of the bus, I realized that I was okay. There were people who were bleeding, but it seemed that everyone in general was okay, except we couldn't find the boy, the boy in the back of the bus. He was under the bus. Because he was in the back, when the window broke and he was small, he went out of the bus. He was ejected. So the men in the bus had to pick up the bus to bring the boy's body out. And he was still breathing. Ten years later in New York, I worked in hospice. And I had a patient there that was 98 years old. It was a woman. And she had a huge tumor in her abdomen. And the doctor said that they couldn't operate on her. And they tried to encourage her to go ahead and let go and move on. She had had a long life and a huge family. She had a wonderful marriage. And it was time to let go. And they encouraged her to move on. But as they talked to her, she was determined that she wanted surgery, that, that she had her shoulder, her hip, and her knees fixed, and that she had insurance, and she deserved to have the tumor removed. This experience caused me to wonder when you have enough, and what is enough in life. When you know this there. Pictures that I This is a person I know. This is another patient that I've worked with. It was a 25 year old man from Jamaica. One day he was playing basketball and uh, he hurt his leg, but he didn't have insurance. So he went a couple of weeks without doing anything and his leg started to get distended. And he had a, um, he had a, um, to be amputated, he had to have his leg amputated. And, and it was a very odd um, cancer that he had. And um, he had chemo um, one time. And when I went to visit him in the hospital, you know, I had to wear complete, almost like a hazmat suit to go see him. Uh, because he had taken, you know, the, uh, the therapy for him was radioactive. And as they give him the medication, they allowed him to go home to rest. And while he was at home, he was never depressed. He never had any issues with depression. He was always happy. And he would jump around on one leg and go about what he was doing. And he would tell the dirtiest jokes you ever heard. He would invite girls to come over. And then uh, he'd tell them, hey, it's your last chance to make, make the radioactive babies come on, you know, I'm a man. And I would think, what? He's 25. 
you know? I mean, and he's going through this life experience. How do you get through something like that? So these three, these three events in my life made me wonder, uh, the two first events made me wonder what's enough, and where does that, um, where does that inspiration come from? In the school of Buddhism, they teach the Heart Sutra. It's very short. It's about 300 words in length, and it explains um, it explains Buddhist teaching. And it talks about no eye, ear, taste, touch, body, mind. No color, no sound, no smell, no taste. If you dig down into the meaning, if there's no eye, the color that you see is not separate. In your mind, you think, I stand here, and the eye was, is within me, and the color is distant from me, then everyone has varying experiences of color. For autistic kids, color may be too much and they have to remove themselves from the experience of that. <coughs> and some who are blind. An artist such as Picasso, who sees color everywhere. So the eye and color are not separate. Color is ingrained in the eye. There's no way to say that a person stops here and the experience is separate from that. Those two things are ingrained. And it's the same with the ear. When I think about my ear as here, as part of my body, and sound removed as sound there, it would mean that everyone has a different experience of that. To grow up part of hearing and have hearing aids as children, and then to lose your hearing, and then receive a cochlear implant, and have to learn to hear again. We all have different experiences. Some people hear perfect pitch, and old men hear different than young children. But sound is not separate from hearing. And we have to start teaching that we are not separate from the world. We are part of and ingrained in the world. If we separate the world from ourselves, then the world becomes a frightening place. And you feel that the world may be against you, that maybe the outside world hates you and doesn't understand me. But if you're a part of the world, then you continue with the world together. If the world's ingrained in you and you're ingrained in the world, then it's a rich experience. If we feel the world is separate from us, then how do we find happiness? We search outside of ourselves for the happiness. We try to fix the world to follow our order and our plans to find our happiness. And you think if you get enough, if you compete and you win and you're rich and you have the right job and the right money and a beautiful family and the right wife, then you'll be happy like Tiger Woods. Is he, did he experience happiness in that way? I mean, he can swing a golf club. And man, he, you know, he carries some trophies. He has the money. But he's completely disconnected from his heart. He was looking for happiness outside, and he never knew what was enough. Michael Jordan, the basketball player, a year ago was uh, voted into the Hall of Fame. And he's very excited. He, you know, he's the best ever. And whenever you watched him, he was beautiful to, when he was playing. You know, I grew up, and I remember 
as I was learning basketball, that I wanted to be the same as him. And, you know, and I would kind of mimic him, and, you know, I, I wanted to be the same. I would copy his movements on the court. And then when I joined the team, I wanted to be number 23. Come on, coach, I want the jersey with number 23. But there was a whole line of kids waiting for number 23. And you know, everyone was very excited to, to see his speech. So for his induction, uh, he stood up. And he sounded so bitter and angry. He said, you know, I, you never believed in me. I proved to you I was the best. And he made comments to other people. You wrote this article against me. And look, what, look at me now. That's everything he seemed to say indicated that he thought everyone was against him. And I thought, this is what it's come to? You know, he tried to take everything from the world, but was completely disconnected from the feeling of fulfillment. And here's an opposite example. This is the French writer. Jack Lasson. When he was seven years old, he was running and fell and became blind as a result of the injury, um, an injury to both eyes. And soon after that, uh, there was turmoil and a war in Europe. And during that, uh, he was placed in a concentration camp. And he was there for years. But during that time, he didn't have depression at all. He was still full of joy, full of happiness, even throughout that experience. And you see that in his writing. He became blind, and he understood that the inside of all of us is where love starts. That inside of us is where happiness begins. That a person who wants to be happy does not need So my point is, within the deaf community, within this time, things are changing. And how do we define ourselves? Are we equal? Are we not equal? Are we beloved or below in the stratus? And when we start to think about us and them, then we start to lose our connection, our oneness. If someone puts us in a group of deaf people, it's hurtful if we're removed and categorized as deaf. Does that mean it's not, it's hurtful because we're not equal with the group? Not at all, because we all know that we're equal too. We're, and we're all equal to God. The hearing people are seeing us as not equal to God when they um, marginalize us. That not only are we, you know, many times we want to fight to show that we are equal with hearing people, but my point is that's not where we need to be. If we get stuck in that thinking of struggle, then it never ends. Just like Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods, there's no end to the struggle. In the example of Christianity, the story of the fall, there's the tree of knowledge, as you see here. And the experience of the fall, of being removed from and searching to be reconnected. Deaf and hearing people are all the same. We're removed from the feeling of oneness and we're searching in the wrong So now as time changes in the deaf community, we might be frightened and wonder what to do. We see the world changing, and everyone is frightened these days in this world with the collapse of the economy, the changes in the environment, with oil prices and everything that's happened recently. We feel almost overwhelmed, and we ask ourselves what we should do.
and we have an increase in fundamentalism of religion. Fundamentalism tries to give the world rules to operate by, to give answers for how we should act. That women should act a certain way and men should act another. And they give us rules so that people can feel that the world is more orderly and not in chaos. And many people will live under those rules and find relief in it. Fundamentalists try to correct the world, to fix it with rules so that we can feel reconnected. There are some people who believe in death fundamentalism, thinking if we, if we change that world, if we make rules, then we can get reconnected. But we're not necessarily reconnected with our oneness, with our heart. So it goes back to the thought of the heart. We have to value what's inside it, us and protect it every day. We have to realize that that fullness and fulfillment comes from inside. We must be silly. And if we see things that are dirty, we have to clean it up. If we see people in pain, we have to help. If people are thirsty, we must give water. We must appreciate every day and the fulfillment of every day. Yesterday, for example, when I was walking in Austin, uh, when I got here, it was raining. And for a moment, I thought, oh, man. But then I realized that I was experiencing my first Texas rain, and I walked out into the rain, and it was beautiful. Yeah, now I'm suffering from allergies. I'm sneezing a little bit, so that's another thing. But um, you know, I would, you know, I, I, one day I was walking with my Zen teacher, and it was a beautiful snowy day in New York. And I said, "Look at the snow! It's so beautiful. The flakes are so huge." And he said, "Yeah." Mm -hmm. And he said, hey, you, Snowflake, you, what are you doing with your life? Make something of yourself. You should be a snowman. Get after it. You know, he was teasing me. He was trying to make a point that, you know, many times I don't appreciate life. I'm always trying to get something done, get a goal done. That, you know, we have such a brief time on this planet that we need to utilize I say this for you, but really I'm saying it to myself, for me. When I got to Gallaudet with Max, we were trying to build a bridge between the oral world, uh, where my background is, and, um, and the campus. I made many mistakes there. I realized that I had judged other people and picked sides and judged their beliefs, and what I realized is that I just had a desire for oneness. There's no need to be wrong or right or hearing or deaf. That we just need to be at one with ourselves. You know, after 25 years of travel, traveling to Africa, I realized that deaf people are the same everywhere and we're all in the same experience. And we don't know what's going to happen in the future. We don't know what we're looking at 20 years out from now. You're saying the jobs in the future, we don't, we don't even know what positions will exist. From this morning, when we talked about what we have to do is just cherish it. Thank you.